Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, uh, Stephen Pinecker, and I'm so excited to have my bud here, uh, Matthew Gill, Prophet, Seer, and Revelator of the Restored Branch of Jesus Christ. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I'm just going to do some shameless promoting here, folks. So the uh, merch store is open. Uh, you just go to mormonbookreviews.com. We've made our website into the merch store. And uh, I got the nice flat written hats, got the t-shirts, got, uh, oh man, I, I, we just keep on adding stuff, phone cases, uh, mouse pads, you name it, um, it's there. And so if you'd like to support our channel and you want to have a little merch to support uh, just to wear, uh, I just want to invite you to check out our mormonbookfuse.com and check it out. And it's great. Last week I sold a hoodie and two coffee mugs. So, hey. That, I'll take that. <laughs> so, uh, Matthew, we, uh, you know, I've got a tremendous response. Uh, first of all, a lot of people are watching uh, both of our interviews. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. The second one, I think a lot of people were very interested because we did kind of like a, a deep dive into the book of Jeronek. So people could hear about, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, I never knew what the story was. I couldn't really access a lot of online information about it. And so I got to have the author, translator, however you want to look at it, um, to come and tell me what's in his scripture. And I thought, this is just like asking Joseph Smith about, tell me about the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> so here, hold up the Chronicles of the Children of Aaron real quick. Okay, so that is what we talked about. We've talked about the Book of Jeronek, and then we're going to briefly touch on the Book of Rayonek if we have time today, because I want us to kind of go talk about that. But you had actually mentioned to me that there's a few... Um, I mean, of course, you've been getting emails, people have been ordering the books, people have been making comments, whether it's on YouTube or other forums, maybe people have been emailing you. You had, you had told me you'd like to address some of the things that people have brought up um, about our interviews and, some, and maybe give some, give some clarifications. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, the, the response has been absolutely fantastic. And um, I'm absolutely grateful for the opportunity that I've had to come onto your show and to talk about everything that we believe in in the scriptures so i just want to make that put that out there that overall the response has been absolutely fantastic there have been a few comments and i've had a few emails um from people i mean nothing nothing downright dastardly and horrible because if it was i probably wouldn't read it but just um i want to make it perfectly clear that um I, uh, I, I believe people do see visions and I do believe that people have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, not just on a spiritual level, but on a personal, tangible level, or well, they can have. And um, I've never said to anybody that anybody that has those things is crazy or nuts. Um, don't know where that comment came from. And, and also um, the, the misunderstanding around the the book of Jaronek itself. I think a lot of people are struggling to, uh, to, to, to understand what it is with regards to its place. It, it's not the Book of Mormon. It's not a Hebraic story. It doesn't have any Hebrew uh, uh, connections. So you're not going to find any Hebrewism in there. You're not going to find the law of Moses in there, which a lot of people have been going on about for some reason or other. Um, so and I just wanted to put those things out there so that people know that I am I am reading comments and I, I, I do listen to and I do read people's emails. Um, and uh, I want to thank also the people who have been supporters of our course. Um, my good friend Jim McKay. Um, is is. Um, yeah, sorry. Jim's a really good guy, and Patrick, his brother, um, they're really wonderful people, and they've been they've been a real blessing in my life too. The fantastic people who are um, who are um, experiencing some difficult times at the moment, um, and uh, he made a response to uh, some of the things that people have been saying about me, which I really appreciated. Um, and I just wanted to express my my thanks and gratitude to him and to his family for um, for being good friends to me and to my family. Oh, wonderful! I'm, I'm glad that you're able to impart that to our audience and to him as well today. Um, you know, one of the was there anything else you wanted to address about comments and stuff people have been or 
no, just keep it respectful. I mean, you know, I I I have a lot of friends who aren't uh, in, revol- involved in the restoration. Uh, uh, Catholic, Methodist, Protestant. I've got friends that are in cut to all kinds of uh, things that I wouldn't be into. But I think it's important, whatever they're into and whatever they do or preach or teach, is we keep the conversation respectful. To to name call or to 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 um, to denigrate people in such a hurtful manner, uh, firstly, isn't Christ-like in attitude. Uh, and certainly not Christ-like in action. And uh, I just don't think there needs to be any place for that. There's enough hatred and malevolence in the world and pain and suffering without people involved within the same the same deep work. I mean, goodness gracious me, we all we all passionately believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. We all passionately believe that the Book of Mormon is true. Um, you know, we need to hang on to those fundamental uh, things and those fundamental things that we have in common before we start, you know, being mean and attacking everybody. And just, just want to say, just, just keep it respectful. That's all. So uh, let's just talk a little bit now about maybe, actually, you mentioned the Book of Mormon. So this is the particular edition of the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the Restored Covenant edition by Zara Hemla Research Foundation based out yep. in the, uh, this is coming from the Independence, Missouri um, uh, expression of the restoration. Um, what made you decide to use that particular edition of the Book of Mormon as your scripture? Good question. I mean, for a long time, we printed our own version of the Book of Mormon. We went and got the basic uh, online, the, the basic 1830 uh, text, and we, 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 we versed it and, uh, you know, columnized it, chaptered it, and we tried to print it ourselves. And then uh, we had um, <laughs> then we had a little run-in with the LDS Church with some legal issues. Um, and then we looked at the cost. It was costing us an absolute fortune to print these books, you know. And uh, I just I just spoke to a few people I know and said, you know, I want to use a Book of Mormon that 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 I can love and respect and get into and and, and uh, that will speak to me and speak to my members. I haven't really found one yet. And yet again, my friend Jim said to me, "Well, have you seen this version?" I said, "No, I've never seen that." So he sent. He told me about it, and um, I think he sent me a digital version first. And um, I just think it is a fantastic uh, rendition of the Book of Mormon. Uh, it's the it's the easiest version of the Book of Mormon I've ever read to read. You know, um, uh, the way it's laid out is is perfect for the reader. Um, so I decided after much thought and prayer and discussing it with everybody here um, that our branch would um, officially adopt it as, as, as the version we were going to use, just simply because it was a wonderful copy. It was, there's a lot of work gone into it. I like the red lettering with the, with the words of Christ. And uh, it's great to read. Uh, the, 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 the indexes are fantastic on it. And um, I was really enamoured by the people that had put so much work and effort into it. And I thought it's a great book. And um, that's pretty much why we use it, really. I mean, you know, I, I don't agree with everything that's in that book uh, with regards to where the Book of Mormon is uh, or the Book of Mormon story takes place. But, you know, the Book of Mormon text is, uh, is, is great. Now, just plus, like plus, the, plus, plus they haven't plus they haven't played about with the text unlike the LDS church have they've played about with the text they've, they've kept some of the King Benjamin issues in there and stuff so I appreciated that good good so now Emma Smith helped uh, put together the very first hymnal along with WW Phelps of the uh, of the restoration uh, and it's similar things happen where your wife has actually put together a hymnal right um yeah this is really really early on. Uh, in our story, even before we'd even established a branch, um, uh, I had a conversation with my wife, Vicky, and um, uh, the con- well, you know, the in- in-depth conversation, we shall say. And um, uh, we, we, I prayed about it with her, and uh, the Lord asked her to 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 um, 
create a new hymnal for for, for our uh, times that was relevant to us. So uh, it's a it's a, it's a it's a simple homemade uh, hymnal, and uh, there's a bit of an introduction in the front about how it came to be, and then there's a, she's done an index at the back. I mean she's she's an exceptional she's an exceptional one, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> she'll love me saying that. Um, and there are some English hymns in there, like uh, Jerusalem and I Vow to Thee, My Country. And it is basically a restored branch hymn. Well, no one else has this. Uh, but, you know, there are there are uh, there are LDS hymns in there, English, old English hymns in there. Uh, we've even although they're not in the book yet, we've even adopted some of the songs of Zion hymns, right. uh, which I really, really appreciate because some of those hymns are fantastic. Um, so yeah, that's where it came from, really. Vicky put it together. Vicky made it, and um, that's what we used. So that's great. You know, um, uh, one of the things that I actually um, wanted to talk about was also I would like for because we're talking about your scriptures and what you have. Um, we talked extensively about the Book of Jeronek, but you also uh, there's a later scripture that that uh, you engage uh, in and re is revealed around year 2015 i believe uh, called That's the right. book of rayanek i'd like for you to maybe just give me like a three minute summation of what is the book of rayanek okay book of rayanek pretty simple is the record uh of the son of jaranek whose name is rayanek and it takes place I want to say maybe 10, 15 years after the book of Jaronek, where it picks up, but it lasts right through to uh, modern times. Um, and it's basically, what he calls it, his, he calls it his chronicle, um, which is basically, uh, they've, they've, they've got no home, they've got no civilization, they're wandering from place to place, and they're, they're trying to figure out where they now fit in this new landscape of Great Britain, which has been overrun by lots of different peoples and lots of different uh, cultures. And they're, they're trying to find a place to fit. And um, it's about personal growth for, for, for Rayanek, personal growth and understanding his uh, position, his priesthood, how he can use that to best help his people. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the culminating event in the book of Rayanek is that the the boy Christ, the a thirteen year old Jesus Christ, visits England and uh, builds himself a little house here, and um, he comes here with Joseph of Arimathea, and um, he uh, teaches the people. Um, so that's really the culmination of the book of Rayanek, and the, and the two books are put together. So you got the book of Jeronek. It ends with this like apocalypse. And then you've got the Book of Ray in it, which picks up maybe 10 or 15 years later. And then the two of them emerge together into, into that, the Chronicles of the Children of Aaron. That's pretty much it, really. I mean, well, just, I just have a quick question. So you have Jesus uh, comes over to England with Joseph of Arimathea, which is which is a a, a story that's been uh, this is not original to the uh, to your scriptures. This is a story that's mm -hmm. commonly uh, told in England. Um, how long was Jesus living? Uh, how long did he stay in Great Britain? It's not clear in in the in the actual text how long he spent here, but given what he's doing. Um, I would probably say about a year. And, and what kind of interactions does he have with the people? Well, um, it's only Ryanex people, so it's not everybody in the UK. It's so just it's just people. so Jesus doesn't engage any of the other cultures, just just Ryanex. Not not that, not that I know of. Okay. Only what's recorded in here. Okay. And he he basically. Um, I suppose he basically tells them a, a sort of very early New Testament um, Christianity, I suppose you would call it. Okay. Um, where he teaches them um, certain things from uh, the Sermon on the Mount that he gave later in his life. 
um, and how to pray properly, you know, that, 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 that now is the, the right way to pray to God. Um, and then, and then of course, there are things where he just he just walks and talks and, and feasts and dances with the people and uh, enjoys their, their their relationship as 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 people rather than actually teaching them something. Um, so uh, he, he 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 gets to know who they are. He looks at their children and he plays with their children. There's there's lots of little things going on there. So it's not just Jesus coming over and teach, teach, teach. It's a real bad relationship. He's there with Joseph of Arimathea on a what you probably call a business trip, if you like. And while he's here, he decides he will contact these people. So, did he perform any miracles? Um, healings and stuff. No. Okay. No. Um, well, that depends. I mean, it depends what your class is a miracle, doesn't it? Um, he heals the land of Ridnon with prayer. And um, the people say that after that event, it grew and it, and it, and it blossomed and it okay. became fruitful again. So, I mean, wow. okay. now, does he then, the, now, does he talk about what is going to happen in the future that he is going to be crucified and risen from the grave? Does he reveal these things to the people? He, he, well, don't forget he's only 13. Right. So he's still young. Right. I mean, I know I know that people have this very weird view of Jesus Christ. Well, I think it's weird, probably unhealthy in some respects, but uh, he's still learning who he is. He's been okay. through that. He's done the, he's done the temple bit when he's lost his parents in Jerusalem, okay. but he's still learning about who he is, and he's still learning about what he is capable of doing. And so um, he does tell them that that he has come to. Um, redeem mankind that he has come to wash away the sins of the world but i don't think it's a fully formed idea like it was when he in his 30s in the bible which probably wouldn't be would it um so it, it's a basic idea that he teaches the people and they know that anyway they know that that, that that the christ who is to come is going to redeem mankind but to hear the actual christ say that, that that's what he's here to do is quite you know uh, uh, what would you say? It's quite uh, powerful to the people that are listening to it. So now, but, of course, I mean, we have a pre. You actually have a pre-incarnate Christ that appears to the people before they cross over the English Channel. So right. they would have known something about a Jesus Christ person, and yeah. they would have had some understanding of what role he was to play. Right. So would you say that after they engage? this young 13 year old boy are the people at this point already christians or do they become christians at that point uh that's a good question um i mean i would probably say that they were on the road to okay. christianity before they saw the childhood christ um they were if they weren't on the road to it i don't think they would have been able to accept the things that he was trying to teach them um uh, especially some of the beatitudes maybe so um yeah i think they were on the road and then once once he'd left and gone home uh, and they were left again on their own they had to they had to continue living a christian style life okay so i i would say that they were on their way to becoming christians and then once christ had left at the after we left them, they were fully, you know, they were fully there. Now, in the Book of Mormon narrative, we have that they, the people in the New World are, are aware of the crucifixion, of the death, burial, and, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like they, they, they know what these signs are. Were these people later on, around 33 AD or whatever, uh, were they aware of the events that were happening in Jerusalem? Ryan X aware. He writes in the in the scriptures that he's aware that the Christ has been crucified and that he has been risen again. He's aware of that. How 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 he becomes aware of that that that's that's uh, that's a different story. Uh, there's a section in the back of the record I received that is sealed, so it's not been opened yet. Okay. I I suspect when that is opened. Um, some of my questions will be answered 
but I certainly I certainly know for a fact that they at least he was aware and I think the people that were with him were aware um, that Christ had, had been crucified and had risen again. Okay. Um, the, the, the reason the reason the reason that is because uh, you would have thought that Ryanek would have been dead by then, but Ryanek um, is not is not dead. He's he's still around. And so uh, he's never tasted death, and he's around no, to this day. No. Yes. And not, and not just him, not just him, there's a whole collection of them. Okay. And uh, and basically, when you say that this is a scripture that goes into modern times, so first of yeah. all, it's not written on plates, it's on parchment that was given to you. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, so how far, when you say modern times, at what up to what point in modern times is he writing? Oh, um, probably, I mean, it doesn't actually give a date. So I'm just guessing from what I remember from reading the text. Um, I don't know when he stopped. I don't know when he actually stopped writing in the record. I know that he mentions certain historical events that he's witnessed. So, for instance, he's witnessed uh, he's witnessed the Roman invasion of Great Britain. He's witnessed the Norman conquest. He's witnessed the the first and the second world wars, although he doesn't refer to them in that in that context. Um, and then he's witnessed m the modern the modern world that we live in. Um, I mean, I don't know the exact date, but it would be pretty close to when I received the record, give or take five or six years. So, um, and is he still writing? Is he still writing? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. And when's the last time you interacted with him? Um, about a year. And what does he look like? He's a tall fella, about I want to say beyond seven foot. Uh, he's got uh, ginger hair, got a nice full beard. Um, he's a uh, dark, I want to say dark complexion, like Mediterranean complexion. Um, uh, he's got piercing blue eyes. Um, he wears clothes that I wouldn't wear, <laughs> personally. But uh, um, I mean, he's just a big guy. I mean, I don't know how to, uh, what else to say. He's, he's a big guy of big, tall, tall and broad stature. Um, he's seen hardship, and uh, and it's in it, it's in his face. You can see it when it's in his face. He's got ginger hair. He's got a lovely beard. Well, the last time I saw him was a beard with a nice bell. Written a nice bit of bell in this. It was interesting, but yeah. Now, did you, how does a, a seven foot tall, broad man with these very distinctive looks go on? Yeah, how how, yeah, how are you able to see him? Uh, well, I'm only, I only see him when he wants me to see him. Okay. So uh, how he gets around unseen, I've been asked that question before. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, but I only see him when he wants me to see him or needs me to see him. Uh, and the reason I saw him a year ago, well, just over a year ago, um, was to take back the, the record that it's written on, I'd given back when I completed the record. So I gave it back in 2015. Uh, but he gave it back to me recently because I, well, I know that the seal, the seal part in the back uh, of the book when I say sealed it's bound with leather um, leather strapping it's bound leather strapping it's got uh, wax seals on uh, that's that's got to be opened in the coming years okay so, and do you use the Yerman thumbum to uh, translate to translate this one mm -hmm. no what do you use no. I didn't use anything is it well and then explain to me how the translation process works Oh boy. Okay, so for me, the Urim and Thummim is a tool to aid people who aren't used to translating to 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 enable them to translate. And the more and more you use the Urim and Thummim, or I don't really call them the Urim and Thummim, I call them the interpreters. But the more you use the interpreters, the less you need to use them. If that okay. makes sense. All right. So you're getting used to the process now. When uh, we received the 
book of Rayanek in 2015, my first question was, you know, do I need interpreters? And the answer was no, you will be aided. And um, I was aided through that translation by an angel who, if I made a mistake, would say, no, go back, read the line, read, look at the line. And, and as I was reading the text on the page, uh, I would either, as as before, I would either see words or I would I would see uh, uh, scenes play out before me, as as it was before. But the way I understand the Urim and Thummim to work, and I still believe this to be the case, is that once you use it and you continue to use it over and over and over again for such a pro prolonged period of time, the less you really need to use it. It's an aid. It's 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 not something that you use continually. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So you wanted to talk about um, a bit about your branch. Um, so just tell me, um, first of all, just some, maybe some unique things that like, for instance, you said you wanted to talk about the word of wisdom, uh, your priesthood, maybe just address those. Okay, so um, I consider the restored branch of Jesus Christ to be uh, a part of the wider restoration movement. OK, and that and that movement's massive and it encompasses lots of different types of what you would call restorationism from LDS on the right to, you know, the, the Bickertonite Church of Christ on the other end of the scale. Right. Um, and, and I would consider that we fit into that um, because we use we use the Book of Mormon and we use the well, we use the inspired version of the Bible. Um, uh, and we use the Doctrine and Covenants, and I know that the Church of Christ don't use the Doctrine and Covenants, but that, you know, that's irrelevant. Um, so I consider that our branch is a part of that wider movement. So uh, we believe that the stuff that's written in scriptures, such as the, the Word of Wisdom, uh, is there for our benefit. Now, unlike many people within the Restoration, it, well, see, the, the, the Word of Wisdom wasn't given by way of constraint. Uh, or it wasn't tied to uh, your eternal salvation. So although it's there and we, 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 we try and stick to it as much as possible, it's not, it's not uh, based on a prerequisite that if we don't follow it, we're going not to, we're not going to you know, be saved. You know? So uh, we don't, we don't uh, live it as, as much as the LDS church do. The LDS church live it really religiously, right? I mean, they even include caffeine and coke and all kinds of stuff into it we, we we're not we don't we don't we don't stick to the law that rigidly um you know I, I, we don't it obviously says don't use tobacco and uh don't only use alcohol for certain things so you know, you know i'm not stupid the last thing i'm going to do is go go out and buy a 20 pack of cigarettes and a bottle of vodka and down them tonight um so we tend to stick to what we can um and as much as we can. And uh, the, the thing that I really, really, really want people to understand is that I do not use the law or the, the, uh, the guideline of the word of wisdom as a battering ram or as a weapon, unfortunately, which is what it's become, to receiving salvation. I think that's wrong. And we don't do that, but we try and live it. And we try and uh, obey it as much as possible. You know, when I uh, was on Mormon Stories and I did that, I consult the Mormon Church. You know, and one of the things I, I don't know if you watched a particular episode, I talk about how if you really want to really be effective with the word of wisdom, is really is you need to make it voluntary as opposed to mandatory. Right, right, right. I mean, that's pretty much what I mean. Yeah, that's pretty much. I mean, it's if if I had somebody come into the the branch and they said, well, you know. I really like having a cup of tea. I really like having a coffee at night. I wouldn't be like, well, you can never be, you can never join us. And, and you, you certainly can't uh, take part in the service. It's nothing like that at all. I mean, I would say it's, it's a very uh, voluntary law that, because I don't, I don't preach it as if it's a mandatory law anyway, because it was never given that way. Um, and so that, that's what we do within the restored branch. It's ma it's not mandatory. It's pretty much voluntary. You know, obviously, if you're given a, a set of guidelines that say, well, if you do this, you're probably going to be healthy. You know, 
you were probably going, well, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I'll stick to that. I won't smoke. I mean, everyone knows smoking is bad for you. Use of tobacco is bad for you in certain instances. So, you know, you want to avoid stuff like that, surely. But I certainly wouldn't, I, mean, I certainly don't get this tea and coffee and um, Coca Cola thing that's going on at the moment. I don't yeah, I just, understand where that's going. I'm curious, you know, we, and we haven't talked about this, but I'm curious. Uh, do you guys, because um, one of the reasons there's Word of Wisdom is that you, is for your temple recommend. What what a role yeah. does the temple or temple rituals play a, a, any role in your church, if at all? Yeah, we, we do have uh, temple worship. Um, but it's based on the temple worship that was done in the Kirtland Temple that's documented very, very widely, which is washings and anointings. Okay. So... Uh, we wash feet, you know, uh, like Christ did, his disciples. Uh, we wash and purify our bodies. Uh, and then we receive a blessing or an anointing with oil. And that is pretty much it. For okay. Temple worship. Um, uh, and, oh, of course, we take the sacrament during temple worship. Mm -hmm. Of course. We sing hymns during temple worship. Uh, but the word of wisdom isn't tied to to okay. Temple. Now, when you say you do sacrament, do you use wine or water or grape juice? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, up until recently, we were using water mm -hmm. because you know that's what we were used to using. We all, most of us from an LDS background, we used to using water. But um, it had been playing on my mind for a while that we should probably be using. Uh, I hate the word wine because when you say wine, people have a really a negative thought don't they but we use grape juice okay pure grape juice and uh that's what we use now but we haven't always okay interesting interesting um okay so uh is it, this is the other interesting thing is that you uh the the priesthood at least one of the uh, the priesthood is available to women members maybe explain that to to the audience so uh Pretty much straight from the off um, when we organized the branch and um, people, women started to ask, well, what about priesthood? And um, obviously from an LDS background, it was a complete no-no, right? So um, we did a lot of talking together as a group of, of saints and a lot of praying together and um, eventually um, the Lord um, told us to um, to give the Aaronic priesthood to females who wanted it who wanted it uh, it's the same with the, the priesthood for males you know it, it's not something that you, you, you come to a branch meeting you join the branch uh, and then, then you get the priesthood like it's a rite of passage. It's only if you feel comfortable having it, the responsibility of having it. But we give it to women. We give the ironic priesthood to women, uh, which allows them to be able to baptize, um, allows them to be able to uh, uh, bless the sacrament, do other other things as well. Um, and um, we we would we would we would strongly uh point out the fact that there is every evidence overwhelming evidence that joseph smith uh mandated the early relief society to have the priesthood or at least the ironic priesthood uh, as he said i want to make this society a society of priests well you can't do that without the priesthood so um so yeah uh from a historical point of view i think that we have uh, every connection to do that and from a from from a modern point of view why wouldn't i why wouldn't you want to give the, the the sisters the opportunity to partake in priesthood ordinances uh now you know people could say well you're not giving them all the priests you're not giving them the Melchizedek priest well no because i haven't been asked to do that but the priesthood that i have been asked to give them that i mean that's more than most people give their members just believe mm -hmm. me um so yeah it's been pretty successful here we've had women bless the sacrament we've you know so yeah. that's great now let me ask you you say they can baptize can they only baptize females or can they also baptize males 
No, they can baptize anyone they like. Great. Good. Okay. Good, good to hear. Okay. Awesome. That's fair. This is fun. Um, as, long okay. as, worthy, as long as they're worthy for baptism, that, that's, they can baptize whoever they want. Okay. Okay. Well, that's cool. I'm, I'm, uh, okay, let me, let's see here. Uh, I let's see. I want to, where, where I want to take this. Um, okay. So um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about your service? For instance, why don't you describe to me uh, what a Sunday service looks like? Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, we start with the, well, we have a presiding officer, which would be me, <laughs> and we have a conducting officer, which primarily on a Sunday is my son, my 18 year old son, uh, pretty much runs sacrament meeting. Um, and and we, 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 all, we all get together, uh, people in the room, people online, and um, we have uh, an opening hymn, then we would have an opening prayer, and then I would get up and say a few remarks about things that are going on with regards to the work, where we are, what we're doing, um, you know, news type of things. And then, um, and then we have uh, our, our sacrament, which, is, which, is, which was this Sunday was blessed by my, uh, my 11 year old son. Um, so we'd have the sacrament, sacrament prayer, and then um, we have speakers. Um, this Sunday, my mom and I spoke. My mom recited a poem. I did a talk about being a peacemaker and what that means. And um, I like, we, we, I try and encourage uh, involvement in the meetings. So if I'm talking or someone's talking about a subject, and someone has a question about the subject I'm talking about, uh, they would they would you know raise their hand and say, "Brother, can I ask a question uh, about what your about, about your sermon or about whatever your your lesson is based on?" And uh, we would I would answer the question. If someone wanted to be vocal in a meeting, like not not this happens very often, uh, you know, "Amen" or you know, uh, "Yes," we, we you know be affirmative. Um, I wanted to move away from a sterile uh, atmosphere, which which I found quite stultifying, where nobody can talk, you've got to be really quiet, kids can't make a noise. Like one of the good things I like about our Sunday meetings is my my youngest son, my seven year old, he's learning, he's growing, he has questions. So when I'm talking about God or Jesus, he has a question about Jesus, and he wants to he wants he wants the answer now. I'm not going to say, shut up, don't say a word until after. What's your question? You have a question about Jesus? Let's talk about Jesus for a bit. Wow. If, if somebody on the the the, the internet, they, they're hearing it and they go, they've got, they've got a question about the subject matter. They, they say, I've got a question, brother, can, and we will do that. So um, our sacrament meetings, I like them to be, not I mean, not overly interactive. I mean, I don't want people you know, getting up and walking out and doing, you know, whatever they want, coming in with a, a bacon sandwich or whatever. But, you know, it, 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 I want it to be, I want it to be a friendly atmosphere. I want it to be an atmosphere where people don't feel constrained. Okay. So like, and then there's, so there's a so spontaneity is allowed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as, as much as, you know, you want there to be spontaneity. So I mean, now, I, I, what about worship? Like, can people raise their hands or clap their hands? They can do, uh, they can, they can, I mean, if they want to raise their hands while we're talking about Jesus or singing a hymn, I've got no, no, no problem with that whatsoever. Um, uh, and what about, what about speaking in tongues? Does that occur in your services? Uh, not that I've witnessed. Okay. No. Um, but because we're trying to foster an atmosphere of spiritual openness, uh, an atmosphere where people, <laughs> feel like they can participate in the meeting it's quite possible that i mean I, for example i know that there have been past members that have had personal revelation during a sacrament meeting and wanted to share that with other people and so they've been asked to come up and speak uh that's happened um 
in meetings before. I mean, it doesn't happen every week, obviously. But yeah, so because you foster that atmosphere of openness and, and togetherness, that happens a lot. You know, you get you get people oh, like, for instance, we sing a lot of hymns, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I mean, it's a lot to us, maybe four or five hymns in one service. I okay. mean, you know, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I really hated growing up in that in the LDS church and being in a meeting where you thought that if you dropped a crayon on the floor and you made a noise, it was you know, out, mm-hmm. out, get out, get out. I hated that. So from, right from the off, really, I've always wanted meetings to be uh, a place where someone's going to enjoy being there, you know, uh, a place where I, I'm really, 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 really particular about children because I have three children and I've got, you know, a young children, you know, one's going one's to be baptised this year. Um, and And they've got so many questions that you if you didn't answer at the time they would get swallowed up with and they'd, they'd forget and i don't think it helps with their their progress and their learning for you to ignore those type of things so yeah if they want to say something to the congregation that they want to say come up come up come up to the podium and stand in front of the podium say what you want to say cool i like that. that i like that so um i wanted to you know i remember I probably about every periodically i would check in What's going on with that church, which originally was called the Latter-day Church of Jesus Christ, right? Is that what you guys were called? And then you ran into some problems. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for a while there, you weren't, um, uh, you, you're, you, 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 it felt like your father kind of took over the reins from, from the, for the church for a while. And I was like, oh, no, was there a scandal? What happened to Matthew? Well, then, as I've gotten to know you, it told me that you actually, um, you suffer from a condition. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Okay. So firstly, about about my dad taking over, there was no scandal. There was there were reports, people, people saying to me, oh, he's had a, he's had a, he's had a mental and nervous breakdown. Nothing like that at all. I suffer from a condition called Meniere's disease. And uh, just to simplify it, it's an inner ear condition and uh, you suffer from vertigo and dizziness and uh, you get sick, you know, you do when you get, get dizzy, don't you? So uh, I went through a really rough patch of that a couple of years ago. And my dad said to me, he said, look, you need to concentrate on your, your health at the moment. The day-to-day running of the, just, just leave that to me. Just leave that to me for now. And I'll take care of that. You just concentrate on your many heirs, concentrate on your family, concentrate on getting, getting well, not getting well, because I'm still, I'm still ill, but getting some kind of parity, you know, get used to the painkillers you have to take and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that was, that's pretty much it really. I mean, I still live with many airs disease. There are days when I fall over down the stairs, up the stairs, on the, on the pavement outside in the shopping center, uh, into the food aisle. <laughs> um, and sometimes I'll get injuries, uh, you know, cuts, bruises, carpet burn, whatever it might be. Um, and, and I take medication. I'm not ashamed to say I take pain relief. I mean, crikey, who doesn't these days? But um, that's pretty much it. That, that, that's pretty much it. There's nothing, okay. really, there's nothing really really to say about it other than that was the issue at the time. And because, because, because I've been out of uh, touch with so many of my older acquaintances, from the LDS church and of course they all believe I've gone mad anyway <laughs> because mm-hmm. why wouldn't he um he left the church and he started his own church he's got his own scripture so he must be absolutely mental mustn't he so uh he must have just lost his mind uh what annoys me about it is is just the 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 visceral visceral hatred about it all it's just it's it's terrible really but you know it is what it is I live with many heirs my family live with it and uh we're coping so that's all so if you if you uh you know so your father is in the first presidency and your 18 year old son is in the first presidency that's essentially the structure of your church um yeah. let me just talk a little bit about your your wife and kids and and, and, and sure. family in general okay yeah i mean i've been married for oh which is bad isn't it <laughs> it's always bad when a guy doesn't know how long he's been married mm-hmm. for 
about 21 years. So uh, I fell in love with my wife. The moment I saw her, I was working for the LDS church in the distribution centre in Birmingham, in the middle of the country. And uh, I'd just come off my mission and I needed a job and they gave me a job. And she, she was coming in that day to do some cover work for somebody because her mom used to work at the distribution doing the magazines and the, the Friends and the New Era and Ensign and all that. And she came in through these big, big warehouse double doors. And I saw her and I thought, wow, she's, she's really nice. I like her. You know, she, she looks great. But I'm not going to go over and say hello or anything. And then a friend of ours said, um, there's a girl in the office. She said uh, she, she, she said she likes you and she doesn't mind that you know that she likes you. Oh, yeah. And I was like, wow, OK, yeah, she's great. I'll, I'll talk to her. And, um, and it went from there, really. And uh, we were engaged for about, I don't know, 18 months. And then we got married in the LDS church and through the temple and all that. And um, we had our first child, my son, my 18-year-old now. And he was born into the LDS church and was blessed. And uh, he was born in 03. And we, I left the LDS church in about 05, something like that, end of 05. So, uh, and then, of course, we've had another two. So this is a really interesting story. Um, when my wife was pregnant with my first child, um, the Lord told me um, that how many children I was going to have and what sex they were going to be. And uh, I said to my wife, I said, the Lord told me we're going to have three boys. She was like, no. And I went, yeah, three, three boys. And he will be there at the birth of the, those children because you're going to need help. And it just so happened that when my second child was born, who is now 11. Um, it was a very difficult birth. Very, 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 very difficult. He nearly died, actually. He had to have uh, CPR when he was born. Um, so, and then when we found out, when she found out it was a boy, my wife raised an eyebrow. And then she got pregnant again with my third child, with our third child. And it was a boy. And it was like, yeah, we I told you it would be a boy. Um, so yeah, I've got three wonderful lads. Uh, Levi, he's 18 and he's a part of the first presidency of the church just a couple of months ago. He's, um, he's about to go to uni. He's growing up. He's going to learn how to drive anytime now. And, um, it's all exciting stuff. And my youngest is going to be baptized in July. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing your family. You know, one of the things before we wrap this thing up is one of your favorite things that you love to do is go to Florida and take the family oh, to Florida. Why don't you tell yeah. me about maybe your favorite parts of Florida? Oh, gosh. Where haven't I been in Florida? Blind me. Um, I like Clearwater um, and I like Tampa. Been to Tampa a few times. The beach there is great. I love the beach of Tampa. Um, and uh oh where haven't i been I've, I've been all over that state um um i just it was the first place i ever went to when i went to america when i was a kid and uh, we just continued going back because it was america it was you know this is america i can't tell you how because you you know you're an american so you're not going to know this but to most kids growing up you know, the standard was anything American is cool. American songs, American food, American clothing. So when I got to go to America, all my friends were like, oh, he's been to America. It's great. Uh, and, uh, and and we and I, when I got married, the first the first holiday my, my wife went on, we went to Florida. It's a great state. We got good weather most of the year, probably all year. And then uh, con compared to ours. And uh, there's great places to go and there's fantastic places to eat. And if you want to go to the really historic parts, you know, there's if you, if you just want to go on a, a non theme park holiday, you can do that in Florida. 
if you want to go on a theme park holiday, well, that's all on the plate there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so we're planning, we were planning on going back to Florida during the pandemic, but we you know it got all cancelled and we couldn't get there. So we're planning on going, um, well, next year. Next okay. Year we're on next year. Well, yeah. now, of course, I'm, I'm in Florida. So if the opportunity yeah. avails, I'd love to maybe do lunch. We should, or... we should. We should. I'm, I'm going, we're going to be there in like the July time. It's going to be quite hot for us. Yes. But yeah, right. I'd, love, I'd love to meet up and uh, say hello. And yeah, let's do it. Be great. That's great. Well, Matthew Gill, um, I want to thank you so much for taking the come on to the program today. That's no problem. I've really enjoyed my time with you. And uh, I can I just say to anybody who hasn't, who's just watching Mormon Book Reviews for the first time, this channel is great. There is something for everybody on this channel. I mean, seriously, um, I love watching Mormon Book Reviews videos just on the book reviews alone. Forget about interviewing people. Um, so I just want to say, I think you're doing a great, fantastic job. I think you're shining a light on parts of the restoration that have never been shone on before. And I love that. And I love the, you know, you, you're talking about books that some people might never have heard of even. And I, I love that. I really, really love what you're doing. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to have been on your show. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Matthew. And like I said, all voices of the restoration are going to be heard on this program. Um, was there any final words, anything you wanted us to cover before we end this up? Uh, I just want to say before uh, I go that um, I don't want to get emotional because I, I, I tend to get emotional when I talk about I, I I'm all about acceptance and love and um, anything that's that's praiseworthy or of good note that's fine i want to be a part of that but anything when it when anything gets negative and, and nasty and quarrelly i i just want to stay away and i would i would encourage everybody that's involved uh in this work to to be more christ-like to listen to open your heart listen to other people's views listen to other people's opinions you might not agree with them that's fine Give them the benefit of the doubt to listen and to talk and to, to tell you what they want to tell you. And the, the one thing I've learned over the past over the past five or six years, really, especially as I've got to know the people involved in the restoration, is um, there are some great people involved in this work, really first rate people. And they're so nice and they're so polite and they're so good. And uh, Give them a chance, you know, give them a chance. Yeah, I was just talking to a Christian um, the other day on Zoom. And I told him, it's one of the nicest things about doing this endeavor is you get to just hang, hang out with a lot of nice people. And just right. being around nice people is just, it's so uplifting. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, that's why I love the people of the restoration. And I also say that's a fruit. That's a fruit that I think is really important. Well, once again, Matthew, thanks for coming on. Um, I want to remind my audience to don't forget to like and subscribe and to hit the notification button for when a new episode comes out. We are on all the major podcast formats and uh, we are growing on the podcast as well. So I want to thank those of you who are listening in on the program. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, mormonbookreviews.com is now the merch store. So if you want to get hats and all that, got all that. Um, if you want to support the channel financially, you could either sign up as a Patreon. And I want to thank all my Patreons. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want to thank uh, those who are also supporting the channel via PayPal. Um, and so those are two means of, uh, the, of, of supporting the channel as well. Uh, I just opened up my bank account for the channel yesterday. So we're making progress. So it's really great. Um, and again, uh, folks, uh, enjoy our summer that's coming up. Hopefully it's not going to be too hot. It's going to be here in Florida, but I'm going to be making at least two trips to Utah this summer. I'm looking forward to seeing you all, and I hope to get out to Independence, Missouri this fall as well. Uh, part of the support of the channel is able to fund my trips, which is really great, and also gives me opportunities for other interviews as well. So either way, once again, you all have yourself a great day, and thanks for stopping.